So my name is Wendy Wells and I'm with the Arkansas River Valley Regional Library and here in Dardanelle. Um, we are welcoming all of our participants today to a meeting that has been scheduled for just a week or so. So we're really happy to see you all here. Um, we are going to be discussing rodents and pets in our yard and we hope that you all will learn a lot today. Jesse Taylor is our gopher and mole expert. He is the um, county agriculture agent from Franklin County. And we also have Pet Bob Powell with us, who's his support man, and also going to tell us everything we need to know about fire ants. Um, if you have questions or would like to chat a little bit, there is a chat at the bottom of the screen that you can add information that you would like to share with the group or if you have questions. And now, Jesse, I'm turning it over to you. All right. Well, I, uh, we've, I've been, been introduced. My name's Jesse Taylor, and I'm the Ag Agent in Franklin County. And today I'm going to be talking about moles and gophers. So just kind of nod your head if you can, um, if you can see my, um, my slideshow. Uh, looks like everybody's nodding their head. So we'll be discussing how to control moles and gophers. And I can give you a big long backstory about this. Uh, I, I just pretty much became obsessed with getting these things out of my yard. Uh, several years back. They were just tearing my yard up and it's kind of embarrassing when you've got an ag degree and you work in the field of agriculture and you can't grow a garden because of these little pesky rodents that, that mess it up. So I got where I could trap them. I got where I could take care of them and get them out of my yard and out of my garden. So the first question that I usually ask people is, are you dealing with a mole or are you dealing with a gopher? because they're very different. The eastern mole, as we can see on this slide, they're an insectivore. The moles, they're not actually eating plants. They're, they're just eating insects, they're eating worms, grubs, things like that. Uh, when you get into a, a pocket gopher situation, that's the, the gopher that we have in, in, in Arkansas, it's just a, a small pocket gopher. They actually do eat plant material. So if you go out to your garden and you had tomatoes in your garden yesterday and you don't today, chances are you're dealing with a gopher. So it's good to understand which ones you're dealing with and it kind of helps you understand about trapping a little bit. And there'll be some people that'll tell you, oh, the, the moles are just a blessing to your yard and, and that's not, however, all, altogether the case. They, they can cause damage to your plants. They can kind of rip the roots loose from the soil as they kind of excavate and under them. Uh, they can really cause some serious damage, especially to, to young plants. So these are just some pictures that I, I got up that shows just the damage that they can cause just by excavating. But you can really identify them by how they're excavating. If you look at a mole, there's always going to be these tunnels or these surface tunnels and a mound. Whereas with a gopher, a lot of times you'll never see a, a, an actual tunnel and their mounds are different. They have these little plugs in their mounds. And it's pretty easy to identify just by looking at the excavation that they, uh, that they are doing. You know, on the right, you can see an example of a gopher and on the left, you can see an example of a mole. And that really helps identify um, what you're dealing with and, and how you're gonna go about trapping them. There are some similarities. They both like loose soil. They both like um, solitary lives. Uh, they seem to breed and reproduce the same time of the year. There are a few differences. I do think moles are more nocturnal. Uh, moles are drawn to water quite a bit more than, than gophers are. Most of the time, if you're dealing with a gopher, you'll catch maybe one or two of them in a yard and a, they, they like more space, it seems like. And, and they seem to seek out banks. A gopher really likes the side of a bank. If you'll drive down the interstate and you look on the side of a bank, side of the road, a lot of times you'll notice gopher mounds in those areas. And everybody wants to know how to get rid of them in the easiest way, if you want a silver bullet, uh, a little terrier dog is probably the silver bullet for all of them. You're doing a really good job taking care of your yard. You're knocking out all the natural enemies that they have, and they've pretty much got all they can stand to eat. 
And, and the best way of getting rid of them is, is put a predator out there with them. And they may not catch that many of them, but they'll make their lives miserable. A terrier is going to terrorize them. It works out pretty good. And there's, there's other breeds that you can use. Um, uh, Cocker Spaniels I saw do a great job. I saw them mix just old mutts do a real good job. Bob talks about his cat catching moles. And um, I don't know if you can do a buried fence with a cat or not, but I know with a dog, you can put a little buried electric fence around your yard and you can train a dog pretty easily to stay in your yard. And it's a fairly inexpensive way of dealing with it. As far as cultural control, the things that I would recommend is try to avoid overwatering and try to avoid watering at night or just before dark. If you'll change your watering schedule to like really early in the morning, that'll help out quite a bit. Another thing that I found to be uh, beneficial is don't overtill your soil. In between your rows in your garden, if you can leave a little hard uh, space in between your rows, it, it really helps out about the moles swimming through the dirt and they don't, they don't like it as, as, as much. They really like the loose tilled soil that you have out in your garden. So far as pesticides go, there are grubicides that you can put out in your yard that will knock out all the grubs and all the, uh, most of the worms. And that will knock out their food source or most of their food source, but it won't knock all of it out. It does, I believe, help lower the population, but I don't think it's just a magic pill that's going to make everything better. They do make these poison pellets that you can get at, at your feed store or at the co-op, and, and they do work. Um, it depends on, um, I'm not sure about the legalities of that in the state of Arkansas, but, but I can tell you that they are effective, but I don't think they're as effective as trapping. Now, I've got a bunch of traps I could go over, but I just picked out the two that I felt like are the most effective. And the first one is just a scissor or a jaw trap. And it's pretty difficult to set, but I do believe it's the most effective one. I think me and Bob have a video out on this on how to set it. You can look that video up. But so, uh, it does provide what I call an all dirt route. Uh, if a mole, or a gopher runs into something that's not dirt, they tend to not like it and they try to go around it or they try to go in under it. With the scissor trap, they really don't come in contact with any part of the trap and that's why I like it the most. Uh, usually I, I can catch a, a mole or a gopher with a scissor trap. The other one that I like is a cinch trap and some disadvantages about it is they actually do have to come in contact with the trigger of the trap and you do have to have two of them. You have to have one going each direction, whereas the scissor trap, it will catch a mole or a gopher coming from either direction. Uh, one advantage I do like about the scissor trap is it's actually down inside the tunnel. So you, you'll actually have that trap put maybe four inches down into the tunnel. So it does make them feel a little more at ease when they come in contact with it and they're more likely to go ahead and knock the trigger. They both are going to take some getting used to. Just about everybody I've ever talked to, when they when they try to use a trap, they there, lots of times they put traps out and they're unsuccessful. And it'll take a while to get where you can actually, um, you know, produce some good results with it. But I would recommend keep trying, pick one of them out, and stick with it. You may not like these two traps that I've been um, I've been talking about, but for me, they're my favorites. You may have another one, and that's just fine. As far as where to set the traps up, I believe is probably the probably the most important factor is understanding where to do that. You can see in um, uh, and, 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 and this picture, we've got little gopher mounds all down through this yard and they're in a relatively straight line. And that's a pretty good place or a pretty good indicator that you can set a trap there and you'll be able to catch one. If you're trying to trap gophers, I'd recommend avoid setting any traps on surface runs. Every now and then you will find a surface run with gophers 
I would not recommend trying to set a trap on those runs. This is a, a picture of how I set up a cinch trap. You'll actually have to dig a hole and find the tunnel. You can see the tunnel way down in here. It's, it's about six inches deep. So you do have to dig a hole. And if you're curious about how to set them up, we've, there's a video of me setting these up and, and catching a gopher. Uh, it's good to wear a pair of cowboy boots or have a, a steel rod where you can poke around the mound and, and find out where the tunnel's at but they're pretty easy to catch and, and um, you could do a good job with it. So far as the moles go, it's, it's a little more difficult. Jesse, sorry yes, to interrupt. Would you mind turning back on your video? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. Does that straighten it up? Yes, thank you. I think I accidentally turned off your video. <laughs> sorry. That's, that's, that's absolutely fine. Well, the, the moles are a little more difficult about finding an active run. Um, you'll find tunnels just all over the place and they'll seem very sporadic. And one of the things I like to do is I like to poke holes in the run, kind of like you can see in this picture. And if they fix those holes within 24 hours or so, then chances are you've got an active run. And, and that would be a good indication of where you need to set a trap is finding an active run like that. Another example that I, I, or another thing that I look for is cracked ground like we have here on the, on, the, on the right. And what that tells me is that that mole has been through that tunnel since it's rained. It rains and it kind of creates a crust on top of the tunnel. And then when the mole goes through there, he breaks that crust and it kind of creates this cracked ground look. If you can find a straight run, of six foot or more with a, with a mole, that's a pretty good straight run. And you can see this picture on the left, it's kind of hard to tell, but it's barely six foot long. Um, they don't really go straight very much. They just zigzag all over the place looking for things to eat. So try to find those straight runs. And, and I, I will say this, it will require you to learn your yard. If you keep trapping and you keep trying at this, you will get where you understand they're coming in at different points and you'll get where you recognize which points they're coming in at and, and you'll get where you're ready for them every year. And it's kind of like catching mice out of a house. You know, um, you, you get where you can do it and it's not that difficult once you learn how to do it. Um, just be patient with it and don't give up. Um, you'll, you'll finally get it. So with that, I'll leave it for, for questions or I'll answer questions that you may have. Rachel, do we have any questions for Jesse on the situation with moles and gophers? Where do you find the video? Uh, that is one of the questions. I'm assuming you're talking about the how to trap uh, moles video. That's on our Facebook page, I believe. Jesse, is it on yours as well? It's on the Franklin County Extension um, Facebook page, and I believe it's on the Yale County as well. Hey, Jesse, we, we had a question. Somebody was asking about the traps as far as are they safe for other animals? So if you have a dog or a cat that's also in that yard, do they need to be concerned about them? I, you can cover that cinch trap up pretty easily, uh, especially if you dig that hole like I showed you. You can put a piece of cardboard over that and you're not going to have to worry about anything. Now, if you do the scissor trap, that's a little different. You could put a five gallon bucket on top of that and try to wire it down. And I could see the scissor trap if a dog or a small cat got into it, it could hurt them, but they would have to get in there and get pretty rough with it. And chances are, my luck, they probably would in my yard. But you can put a bucket over it and cover it up. They won't be able to get to it. Jesse, those traps, you find those at, I mean, does the co-op handle them or? Most co-ops don't have the cinch traps. Now there's some of them that do and, and you can find them. But I, I, I order mine online and I will recommend that you pick out specific sizes. A, a medium mole is probably the best size for your cinch trap. Um, if you're dealing with, uh, with gophers or moles, that seems to be the best size. Now, if you get into something that's um, 
if you order something where it says a large gopher, it's so big that it doesn't really fit in the tunnels that the, that the pocket gophers make. Mm -hmm. The scissor trap, that Victor scissor trap, you can get that at Lowe's, Home Depot, Tractor Supply, mm -hmm. Atwoods. It's pretty easy to get. Okay. So will one trap work for both go, gophers and moles? If I was ch if I was catching gophers, the cinch trap is is by far the easiest, and you just about have a hundred percent success rate with it. the The moles, I would try the cinch trap first, and then if I can't catch them with that, then I would go to that Victor scissor trap. The cinch trap is a lot easier to set up, and and most people they're they're able to do it and learn it pretty quick. We have a question on here about what kind of pellets or poison is recommended for use. Well, you can buy pellets at the feed store and, and they will be labeled as mole or gopher pellets. And I, but like I said, there are some issues about that being legal or not. And I mean, it's labeled, you're not breaking the label, the label's the law on that, and you're not breaking any laws concerning the label, but there are some issues about putting that poison out that are, um, you have to watch how you do that. We've got some interesting ones now. If you have a chance to look at them, you might want to take a look. Um, one says, wouldn't it be easier to kill their food source, the grub worms, instead of using traps? Another asks, and do solar repellents work? The solar repellents, I would, the sonar repellents, I, I wouldn't recommend them. I've, I've found active tunnels right next to sonar repellents and, and it wasn't phasing them at all. So far as killing out all the food source, you'd have to kill out every living organism that's basically a, 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 of an insect orient You'd have to kill everything. It's not just grubs and it's not just worms that moles are eating. They're eating just about any type of insect that buries itself beneath the ground. Um, the years that we have cicadas, a lot of people call them jar flies. Um, a lot of times you'll, it, the years that we have the, um, the, the outbreak of them, I guess, a lot of times that year we also have uh, more of a mole population because they're feeding off of the cicadas that's coming up out of the ground. We also have one here, sounds like a home remedy. Have you heard of using used kitty litter in the holes? Well, <laughs> it might keep them from going through that particular tunnel, but they'll find a different one. Okay, well, if we have any more questions for Jesse about the moles and gophers, I'm going to uh, let those go and be answered on the Facebook Live or later on when we do the watch program. And I'm going to turn it over to Bob Powell now and ask him to talk to us about fire ants. That's something that a lot of us are dealing with in most of uh, the pastures around, but also right here in town. Bob, you will got us an answer for all of this? Well, I'll do my best. Uh, obviously, there's probably not hardly anybody in Yelp County that's not dealing with fire ants, and most of our surrounding counties are doing the same. So uh, they're a problem, and I'm going to go ahead and see if I can share my screen. Uh, Okay, Wendy, are you seeing my screen now? I am, thank you. Okay, all right, we'll go ahead and get started here. So first off, let me, uh, let me say this. Um, I am not an entomologist, and the person that I work with with the uh, university on fire ants is Dr. Kelly Lofton, and he is the one that put most of this slideshow together. So uh, 
if you get uh, too way out in the weeds on questions, I'll probably refer some of these to uh, Dr. Lofton, but uh, through working with uh, Dr. Kelly Lofton over the last four years on some demonstrations in Yale County, I have, or at least feel like I've got a pretty good handle on, on how to really do a good job getting the numbers of fire ants down where they're not such a big problem. We're not ever going to get rid of fire ants, I don't think, here in Yale County. Uh, they have been progressively moving northward over the last several years. So, uh, you know, we're probably just going to have to learn to deal with them, to uh, keep the numbers down uh, so that we can go out in our yard and our kids can go out in our yard and not worry about getting eat up with fire ants. But to say that, you know, we can probably quit putting out uh, baits or quit worrying about them, Probably not going to happen, but but there are some things that you can do that can certainly uh, get rid of most of the fire ants in your yard. And we're even going to talk just a little bit about fire ants in pastures because those have, have well they've also become a huge problem here lately. So uh, anyway, we'll go ahead. I'm going to run through probably most of this uh, slideshow rather quickly, and then at the end, I'm going to talk about what I've been actually doing here in my demonstrations, what I've seen work, what I've seen not work, and uh, hopefully give you some good practical ideas of what you can do in your yard or in your pasture uh, if you're having problems with these. So um, a little bit about the fire ants. Uh, it says they're found in 56 counties. I would argue that we can, you know, there's 75 counties in Arkansas. I've been up in Washington County and some of the northern border counties, and I have seen fire ants, I think they're in every county in Arkansas. Now, obviously, the southern to the middle areas of Arkansas, they're a bigger problem, but they are moving uh, northward a little bit more, seems like each year. There are the two types, mainly what we're seeing is the red imported fire ant, but there are also some other, or a, another strain is called the black imported fire ant. No major differences in those two strains though. So uh, Union County, right down at the very bottom of the state, that was where they were first uh, found and that was all the way back in 1958 when uh, they moved into Arkansas and like I said, they have gradually moved up and you can see uh, just recently, Polk County was added into uh, the area of Arkansas where that was a heavily infested county. Uh, so they, they're here, and like I said, even up in some of the northern counties, even though they're not listed as a big problem there, I, I think you can find them in all the counties. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more in just a minute about those 39 counties right now that are currently under the uh, fire ant quarantine. So uh, we'll mention those here in just a minute. So identification, most of you, I think, probably would have no problem identifying the fire ant, uh, especially if you stir up the mound. They are super aggressive. They are, uh, you know, most other ants are not near that aggressive. They're not very large unless you uh, find a queen. So uh, I don't know how well you can see this little diagram right here, but they are all different sizes. I mean, from the workers, very, very, very small, and you know they they can go all the way up, like I said, to the queen, which you probably won't ever see unless you dig up a nest that are actually pretty good size. But uh, so aggressive behavior is one of the biggest traits when it comes to identifying fire ants. And yes, if you've ever had the sting of the fire ant, you understand where they get their name, fire ant, because it it does sting like fire. So uh, that's uh, a little bit about the sizes and the identification of these things. There are actually, uh, th there will be four different uh, stages of uh, their life cycle that they go through. And uh, those are listed right here. And you can see the, uh, the larval stage and then they'll have the pupil, the pupa stage. And then here are the adults, and like I said, these are the workers, and these over here would be the queens. So we'll talk just a little bit briefly about what they do and, and how they, uh, their, their role as far as what they do in the mound. So the, the fire ant 
can bite. It does have mandibles. It can bite. But what you're feeling when the fire ant gets on you and, and it hurts is the actual sting. And so when they sting, they actually put venom into you. And that's what makes the little blister with the pustule on top. Uh, about one to two percent of the people uh, are allergic to the sting of the fire ant. That's not to say that probably everybody's not going to have a reaction if they sting you. You know, you're going to have that little bump with that little white blister on top. But uh, there are a small percentage of people that a sting from a fire ant could send them to the emergency room. So, you know, if you're in that category, uh, this becomes much, much, much more important about trying to control the amount of fire ants that's in your, in your yard or anywhere that you may be. So everybody's seen the mounds. Uh, mounds are a good indicator that fire ants are in your yard or in your area. Uh, I will say this, they're not the only indicator. A lot of times, and last year was one of them, a lot of people thought last year that a lot of fire ants may have went away. They just weren't making mounds as much last year. And I'm not sure it was, I'm sure something to do with the environmental conditions. Late in the summer, we started seeing the mounds, but the fire ants were there all summer long. So, uh, you know, the mounds, like I said, yeah, you definitely can say you got them if you see the mound, but even if you're not seeing mounds, a lot of times you've still got fire ants. You may not just realize it as much. Those mounds, uh, man, they can really make your yard look bad. They can cause losses of uh, forage in your pasture. They can be problems on foundations with your house. And for some reason, they really like to build those mounds around outside air conditioner units and other electrical type devices. Uh, a lot of times people have had to go in and replace certain components in their outside air conditioner units just because of fire ants. So, you know, they, they can uh, not only be unsightly, but they can cause you a lot of problems with things as well. Uh, so, you know, we talked about there's uh, the queens and then there's the workers. I'm not able to see all of my, let me see if I can do something here. There we go. Okay, so the queens, they will mate once, and then they will live up to seven years, which was surprising when I read it. I didn't realize that either. Uh, usually three to four years. Uh, the workers, they'll only live 30 to 90 days. The queen will produce 500 plus eggs each day, up to 3,000. So you can see in her lifetime, she's going to produce millions of, uh, of eggs. So uh, they, they're very prolific little creatures. Some of the mounds will be a single queen, probably more of them will have more than one queen uh, in that colony. So the life stages, like we said, is the egg, the larva, and the pupa, and the adult. We done mention that just a little bit. So uh, I'm going to say just a little bit before I go on too about this uh, fire ant quarantine because a lot of people aren't, I don't think a lot of people are even realize that they may live in a quarantine county and that has some, uh, some, some real uh, applications to you if you're a farmer, if you sell firewood or anything like that. So let's take a look real quick. This is the map of all the counties in our surrounding states that are under this quarantine. Like I said, Pope County just got added, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago. I don't think uh, Franklin County's in it yet. I don't think Logan County's in it yet, but you're probably gonna be in it soon enough, but right now you're not. But so what does it mean if you are in this fire ant quarantined area? Well, let's take a look at what it means here. So if you are in a quarantine area, then uh, I keep getting this. I need to move that, Rachel. Okay, so you have uh, restricted things that you're not allowed to move from a quarantine county to a non-quarantine county unless you get that restricted item uh, certified that you have absolutely no fire ants on it. Uh, one of those being uh, 
anything with soil in it, such as uh, potted plants, uh, sod, anything like that. So, you know, if you're selling plants and things and you're selling them outside of a quarantine county, then like I said, you have to have that certified that you don't have any fire ants uh, in that. Um, grass sod, like I said, hay bales. You know, if you probably noticed, if you store around uh, hay bales outside, a lot of times those hay bales will get fire ants up in them. So if you got extra hay and you're wanting to sell it, you need to store it on pallets. Uh, you need to make sure that you uh, keep some kind of bait out there around there where you're storing those uh, hay bales because if you get fire ants in them, legally in order to sell that outside of a quarantine county, then you have to uh, call and get that certified that there's no fire ants. And, uh, you know, so like I said, being up on pallets, things like that, that's going to make you less likely have the fire ants in the bales. So any type of soil moving equipment that has soil on it, it just has to be clean, good, make sure that it has no soil remaining on it before you move it outside of a quarantine county. So like I said, a lot of people are, are in those counties uh, and didn't even realize it and didn't realize you have those restrictions. So these are just some examples of some of the things, like I said, nursery plants and what have you. Uh, we talked about the hay. Hay is a hay is a really a, a bad source when it comes to moving because a lot of people they do sell hay. A lot of our hay when uh, we were having drought situations, you know, we we seen trucks on the interstate with hay going all over the place. And man, you can really really transfer some colonies to fire ants with those hay bales if you're not careful. So let's talk a little bit about control. Uh, controlling fire ants is, it's, uh, it's challenging, but, and I hear a lot of frustration out there from a lot of people. If, if you do this and you do it right, control is really not that hard. It's kind of like uh, Jesse said with the moles and the gophers. It is something you're gonna have to be persistent at. Uh, there's not, uh, I don't think there is that silver bullet for controlling the fire ants. And some of these uh, chemical controls we're gonna talk about are a little bit pricey, but you know, the, the main thing is if you spend the money on these, you want it to work. And I think that's where a lot of people either maybe they don't read the directions well enough, they just don't understand some of the, some of the do's and don'ts when it comes to some of the different types of chemicals that you can put out there to help control these fire ants. So we're going to talk about, uh, mainly we're going to put them in two different categories. One, we're going to call them the baits. And baits, and we'll talk a lot more about these in a minute, but you do not want to water in a bait. And I think that alone will help a lot of people because, you know, some people feel like, you know, they need to put water on it and water it in, not if it's a bait, okay? Contact insecticides, on the other hand, most of those do need to be watered in. And I guess bottom line on this, read the instructions and it'll tell you, but a lot of these contact insecticides, um, you either have to wait on the rain, turn your sprinklers on or do something in order for them to be activated. Uh, now, if it's a powder, uh, the white powder that smells so bad, asphate, you know, like that, for instance, you put that on a mound, it does not have to be watered in, but, but a lot of these do. So bottom line, uh, understand what it is you're putting out, read the instructions on that label and make sure you do it correctly. But I'm going to talk about some things here that I've done with these also that may help you out. So I want to mention these. If <laughs> I put a post on Facebook a while back about some fire ant control and I got tickled at a lot of my comments. Most of them I, I didn't even respond to, but uh, you know, if you're pouring gasoline down that fire ant hole, that's not very environmentally friendly. You're not going to kill the whole colony more than likely if you're doing that. You're going to you're going to kill whatever that gasoline lands on. It may give you a little satisfaction of seeing some of them die, but more than likely those workers are gonna move those queens, they're gonna move those eggs and you're gonna have another mound pop up right beside it. And 
like I said, for the environment, that's really bad. Diesel, same thing. A lot of these other chemicals here that uh, you can see on here, they're really not made to be out here put into the soil. I really get tickled about the grits. They eat those and blow up. Yeah, I want to. I want to see a video of that one. So uh, I I don't think that's going to work. Uh, there is one home remedy here that is probably if you wanted to use a home remedy, it's probably the most effective would be the hot water. But you're going to have to have boiling hot water, and it's going to take a lot of it, and you're going to have to do that to each mound. And uh, I, there's easier ways to get rid of them. So uh, most of the home remedies that you hear are not effective. They just cause them to move. You can take a wooden stake, you can drive it into the mound, and more than likely in three or four days, you can go out there and there won't be an ant in that mound. You, you disturb the mound, they all get excited and they move the queen and they start another mound somewhere else. So that's why a lot of people will think, hey, I, I killed them. I put this on there and they're not there anymore. Well, you moved the mound more than likely is what you did. So yeah, most home remedies uh, not gonna work. So the extension recommends what we call a two-step method. And I said, I wanna get into this a little bit more here in a minute after I get through the slideshow, but we, we recommend a bait. I like the baits way better uh, than any other thing you can put out. And I've tried a bunch of different ones and we'll talk about the ones I've tried and the ones I've been very successful with, but the baits are really good. And we broadcast that bait over the entire yard. We, we don't just go out here and try to scoop a spoonful out on mound. Now, once you broadcast a bait, you're going to usually get eight to 10 weeks control during that 10 weeks. You may see a mound pop up, then treat the mound, but do that after you broadcast a bait application out there. And like I said, I'm going to give you some very specific baits that I've used here in a minute, ones that I have had very good success with. But uh, so that's what we recommend is this two step method. It's a broadcast application of a bait and then go back, Give it, give it about two weeks to work, and then if you see individual mounds pop up, then you can treat those. Um, and treating those, there's a lot of different things you can do mound treatment with, but uh, I'm gonna talk more specific about the baits here in just a minute. Uh, down at the bottom of this, it says don't treat for fire ants unless they're present, and we're, yeah, we'll talk about that more here in a minute too. So the toxins, the baits, so, what you can see in this picture right here is this golden stuff, and it is a fire ant bait which is covered with an attractive material. The attractant is usually uh, corn, it's ground up corn. So uh, the ants are gonna like that, and they're gonna pick it up, and they're gonna carry it back into the colony, and they're gonna feed it to the queen, and a lot of the workers are gonna eat it. And you know, some of it kills the workers, and will eventually kill the queen. A lot of it will just, a lot of them, depending on which one you use, may just make the queen sterile. So she's laying sterile eggs instead of fertile eggs. So uh, that's uh, the important thing to know about that though, is that bait, they won't take the bait if it doesn't have the corn on it. So you can't get the bait wet. And that is one of the most important, I think, mistakes that a lot of people make when they're putting a bait out is they either put it out maybe when there's a heavy dew on, they put it out right after a rain and the ground's still wet. Uh, maybe it comes to rain on it two hours after they put it out. The ants have not had time to take all of it in. So therefore it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be effective. And once it gets wet, it's done. They're not gonna take it in and you wasted a whole lot of money. So, uh, and another thing I might say on that, scattering this in your yard, you only got about 25 of those granules every square foot. That is safe for most pets, okay? So you don't have to worry about that. But when it's piled up like it is in the, the glove right there, a lot of animals will eat it. So when you store this stuff, make sure you store it, uh, preferably in the bag that's sealed up. But, but don't leave it out there in a bag where your pets can get to it because when it's in a pile like that, it is possible they could eat enough of it to cause them a problem. 
So the further south you go, the more treatments it's going to take to have 90% control. You look over here on this uh, map on the left over here, at least on my left, then to get 60% 60 60 control, one treatment, all you need. But it, it, most people aren't going to be happy with 60% control. You're still going to have, you know, a lot of mounds probably left out there to try to treat. So, you know, to get this 90% uh, control, mostly uh, we're, we're, we're going to be close in this area between two and three treatments, but I've had pretty good success if you do them right with just two treatments. And those two treatments it just make it real easy to remember somewhere around Labor Day and then, you know, Memorial Day to Labor Day. If you can treat around those two times of the year, uh, you'll have pretty good control year round. So, uh, but we're gonna talk about here the, as far as the early treatment and the kind of the late spring, it's very important that you make sure those ants are feeding. And I'll show you how to make sure they're feeding here in just a minute, because this year, if you had treated on Memorial Day, you wouldn't have been happy. So uh, the ants were not feeding good. We were cooler than normal. Uh, it was also very wet around that time. So, uh, you know, Rachel could tell you that, you know, my demonstration that I was trying to get out, I kept trying every week in, in May and it was either too wet or too cold. And so, you know, those two times are just kind of rules of thumb. You have got to make sure those ants are feeding and that you're going to be able to keep that bait dry once you put it out. So, okay. So, we're going to talk just a little bit about some baits. Um, this was one of the first ones I ever used was extinguish. And there's an extinguish and probably the more common one you'll see in the stores is extinguish plus. The extinguish, if you'll notice right here, it says four to eight weeks is uh, how long it takes it for it to start controlling. Okay. That's a long time. When I first started using this stuff, I put it out and I was going back every week and checking for a presence of fire ants. I was finding ants, like say, every you know third week, fourth week, I'm, and I'm thinking this stuff is terrible. But it did finally start working. And once it did start working, it was one of the longest acting ones that I had. But for most people, four to eight weeks is not acceptable for it to start working. So I don't ever recommend this one unless somebody's just wanting to put it out in a garden. Extinguish Plus is rated for everything you see here, except gardens. So the Extinguish Plus is not rated for the garden. It is for pastures, it is for cropland, it is for your yards. Here's what I tell folks. So if you've got a small garden, if you will treat the perimeter of your garden with Extinguish Plus, those little fire ants will feed a pretty good ways away and you'll probably get control in your garden just by treating the perimeter of it. But the Extinguish Plus itself is not labeled for gardens. So there's the Extinguish Plus I was talking about. It is, oh, and I didn't mention a while ago, it's an IGR, which is an insect growth regulator, as well as a toxin, which that toxin is what gives it the much quicker control. So instead of four to eight weeks, Extinguish Plus will start working in two to three weeks and you still get that real long, what I would call residual control, which is up to 10 to 12 weeks on this stuff. So I am a big fan of Extinguish Plus. You will think I work for this company by the time we get through because this is my product of choice right here. And this is what I've probably had better success with on all of my demonstrations and we're doing a pasture demonstration right now as well and this is what i'm using on it it's just there's some other good ones uh and i'll mention those as well but i probably had the longest the most residual control using the extinguish plus so andro one of the real common ones um andro is good as well and it, it again will start working in that two to three weeks and it is a bait, as all of these I'm mentioning right now are baits. They're best to be broadcast over the whole yard. Uh, you know, you can do mound treatment with these as well. 
so you could do a broadcast treatment with it and then you could go back and uh, treat your mounds with it also. But uh, this is Amdro, like I said, it's pretty popular. Esteem, another IGR. The IGRs are awesome. The insect growth regulator, that's what causes that queen to be sterile. But here again, four to eight weeks, not acceptable for most people. So, uh, you know, you got fire ants, you want them dead, not a month later, or two months later, you want them, you know, just as soon as possible. Uh, the good thing about a steam, kind of like extinguish, it's rated for all those areas that we talked about along, along with your vegetable gardens and most crops. So, uh, you know, if you're just having to deal with this in a vegetable garden situation, this might be a good choice for you. It does work and it has good residual as well, but it takes it a long time to work. Siesta, if you are having a picnic next week and you got fire ants out there, don't go put Extinguish or Extinguish Plus out or any of those others that I've talked about. Get you some of this stuff right here. When I used it in my demonstration, I always go back a week later and I check for presence of ants this one by far kills them the quickest. Uh, it does not have the most residual control. You will see ants coming back in a little bit quicker with siesta, but you'll still probably get a good two months control out of it. But you will have ants dead in four or five days out there, sometimes two or three. So uh, this stuff is really good if you got a, a situation where you need them gone and you need them gone quick. Uh, come and get it here again. Uh, this one is a toxin. It is not an IGR, um, but it is a bait. So once again, you do not want to water this in uh, and it, it will kill the queen. It starts working about like the extinguish about two to four weeks. This one again can be used in gardens. So as far as a garden kill, it's probably your best choice on that because most of those others that you can use in gardens, you're looking at four to six weeks before you get uh, control out of that. So, you know, if, if the garden is one of your main things that you want to treat, this one's probably a pretty good choice for you. Uh, so I want to talk briefly about you got a bait, you need to broadcast it, how do you do it? Well, this is called a herd seeder, that's H-E-R-D. You can buy these online. Uh, the whole system to hook up to your four wheeler and everything, they're expensive, run you about $500. I don't recommend that if you're just treating your yard, but if you're treating pastures or large areas, these are awesome because they have special plates that you can put down in the bottom of them. And they have a plate for extinguished, they have a plate for siesta, they have plates for all of these different fire ink uh, baits is very specific to that bait that as long as you drive the right speed and it'll have a chart to tell you that it will put out the right amount. Now, if you don't have one of these seeders and most people don't, well, how do you do it? Here's the good thing about baits. You do not have to cover 100% of the area. Let's say you got a yard out there and, and, and just so you'll know, an acre is about the size of a football field. Most of these baits, the ones that I mentioned a while ago, most of them will go out at about a pound and a half per acre. That's going to get most yards, okay? So what I would do is I would get the right amount of bait for whatever area that I've got, and then I would get me a little hand spreader, set it on the smallest setting that you can set it, and then put your bait in there and, and start applying it in strips about 30 feet apart. If you get all the way across your yard and you still got bait left, go back over it again. The ants will cover, I know they'll cover up to almost 75 feet to go get the bait and take it back into their mound. So, you know, as long as you get it scattered out there halfway even, you're going to get pretty good control. Okay, so don't think you've got to get it on every square foot out there because the ants are going to help you out. They're going to go get it. And once one of them finds a granule, it's kind of neat because they're going to go tell everybody else in that mound, and buddy, there's going to be a little trail going out there picking them up. I put some out two weeks ago in a pasture, and it was it was pretty awesome to watch. Uh, they were having they had that bait 
cleaned up almost where you couldn't find any of it in that field within an hour. And I was putting out strips at a hundred feet apart. So, uh, yeah, they'll, they'll find it. If you'll get it out there, but you need to try to scatter the right amount per acre and try to get it scattered out there as even as possible. So real quick, kind of some common mistakes, putting it out when the ants aren't active. I'm going to show you how to tell if they're active here in a minute. Uh, don't get the product wet if it's a bait. Now, if it's not a bait, then you may want to get it wet, but the baits are what I recommend. They don't need to get wet. You need to store it properly. You really need to use it the year you buy it. I think you'd probably be all right if it was stored in a good area to use it the second year, or the following year, I should say, but, but you know, three or four year old bait, that corn's gonna start to get rancid. Ants aren't gonna like it as well, and you're not gonna have as good a control. So don't try to use bait that's three or four year old. Um, you know, try to put the right amount out. Uh, you know, don't water in your bait. And you're not supposed to disturb the mound. You know, if you want to go up and kick a mound to see if they're all uh, going to be in that mound, uh, you're not going to get as good control. Because once you kick that mound, what you've done is you, you've not, they've gone out of the feeding mode into the protection mode, and they're not as apt to take that in. So uh, you don't want to disturb the mounds when you treat them. Uh, so we talked about baits. These are contact insecticides, and they're going to be in the form of a dust, a drench, or a granule. Most of these, now not the, not the dust, but the granules and the drenches, they do have to be watered in. So, uh, and you can get good control out of these, but I just don't like them as well. They don't seem to work as good. Don't seem to get the residual control out of them, and you know, you've got to either try to time it right before rain or if you've got sprinklers, obviously that's not as big of an issue. But uh, so the contact insecticides, I'm not as big a fan of. Not gonna say they don't work, just I don't like them as well. These are examples, I'm not going through each one of these, but you know, these are active ingredients. There's a lot of brand names out there, but uh, you know, the cyphalopurin, acetate, permethrin, bif bifenthrin is a really good one. Uh, Cabaril, Electric Liquid 7, uh, Lambda Psi, all of these are contact insecticides. They'll kill every ant they get on. Ants go across it, it'll kill them. But it's just, like I said, you don't typically get the residual control out of these as you do the baits. Um, Asphate's probably a really good mound treatment. It stinks. Uh, it's a little old powder. You'll put a teaspoon out there uh, or so on a mound, but it, it does work good for mound treatment. Uh, bifenthrin is really, as far as the, the toxins, it's, it's probably one of the best ones out there for a toxin, uh, like I said, but they, they do need to be uh, watered in. Um, over and out, pretty popular one as well, and it's, again, it's a combination of two different pyrethroids. So uh, biological control, I'm going to go with this very, very quickly. Uh, we're gonna run out of time here pretty quick. But uh, there is such a thing as, and I'll just get right onto it, the forward fly. Forward flies are things that the government has put out, which they lay an egg on the ant and uh, the larvae goes up to the head of the ant and it dies. These things have been put out in all of these counties down in the south here. So, uh, so let me talk real quickly and then I'll wrap this up. My demonstrations that I've done, and this is what I've kind of seen work and what didn't work. So I had my first treatment or my first demonstration was this one right here. I had this untreated check with no bait. This was my extinguish right here. These were five weeks after I put this out. So you notice my untreated check. I don't have a way you can see that, but that that hot dog, I use hot dogs to see how many ants are out there. It's covered. All of these others, Extinguish, Advion, Esteem, these were all clean five weeks later. 12 weeks later, I'll say this, the Extinguish Plus was the best spot, but I don't have pictures to show that. Uh, this is pretty wordy and you probably can't, rec uh, probably can't read most of this, but most of it I've already said, but I want to I want to say just a couple of things here to emphasize. I do recommend treating your whole yard with an IGR granule, 
a bait. Make sure that you get that bait out when those ants are feeding. That's not a problem in July, it's hot, they're feeding all the time. But if you're treating in May, especially if you're trying to treat in April, if it's not being at least 60, 65 degrees at night, they're probably not feeding. So uh, how do we tell if they're feeding? Well, throw a hot dog out there. Throw it out there, stick a flag or something up her bike, go back 30 or 40 minutes later. If it's not covered with ants, and this one's not really covered a lot, I like to see them more than this one, but if it's not covered with ants, just randomly throw them out there. Don't put them on a mound, just put them in the yard, and then this will let you know. If they're not feeding, if that hot dog looks like this, don't put your bait out. If you put bait out there and that they're not feeding, you wasted your money, okay? You'll never get 100% control. Don't expect it. 90% control is awesome. If you get that, you've probably done really good. Get your neighbors to treat as well, especially if you're in a small neighborhood because, uh, you know, if everybody's treating, it's going to make your control a lot better. Uh, okay. Uh, like I said, don't get it wet. We talked about that. And I am doing a fire ant uh, pasture control. You can call me about that. I won't say a lot about that right now, but what we did was a perimeter treatment and then we did strips every 100 feet. We'll be seeing what kind of control we get. It's gonna cost somewhere a little over $5 an acre to treat a pasture. But uh, for some of these pastures that are really loaded, I think it's gonna be well worth that. So. I'm done. Bob, we're we're going to have to pre get pretty close to concluding here. Some of the questions that were asked were really good ones, so I hope we have a chance to go back and, and kind of answer them, but we're about out of time. I want to thank Rachel uh, Cheney and Monica Mitchell for helping us out today with our uh, presentation, and I really want to thank Bob and Jesse for joining us and giving us all this information. Please be sure and do the post test afterwards. This helps the extension service know uh, if they're doing a good job and if you enjoyed their um, participation with this program. Please also come back and join us again. Look for us in the future, um, putting out virtual type uh, seminars and um, clinics. And we thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm going to call this a conclusion. Rachel, unless there's anything else you'd like to say. No, we, we did have this scheduled from two to three. Uh, we will, uh, I did take down some of your questions and hopefully what we went over today, and by way I mean Bob and Jesse, thank you so much for doing that. But hopefully we've went over some of the questions you may have had during the presentation. Uh, you can contact your local county extension office if you have any questions. Um, and then also uh, be sure to follow us on Facebook. We'll be putting out updates. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.